Kia ora koutou atero. Thank you for joining us. It's an extremely important and powerful discussion around the up and coming cannabis referendum in New Zealand. My name is Stephen McDowell, aka the Buzzy Kiwi on social media, and I'm the creator of the short documentary Grassroots, The Reality of Legalization. I spent years researching cannabis for my film, in which I came to the same conclusion that it seems most people do once they see the evidence with their own eyes. Can cannabis prohibition does not work and legalization is the only way to reduce any harms associated to cannabis not to mention the overwhelming economic, medical, social justice benefits that New Zealand would experience from legalization. However, I'm only one person with only one voice, so it's truly my pleasure to be here today with an expert panel of academics so we can dive deep into this topic and answer all your questions with science, statistics, facts, and reality. A lot of people have misinformed opinions about cannabis and preach it as truth. So we are here today to address this with actual evidence-based facts and highly educated recommendations. Education is key to making an informed decision in this referendum. So the purpose of this webinar is to provide a credible source of information as well as answering all your questions. So you can both learn yourself why legalization is the right choice for New Zealand and also go out and teach the closest people to you with your newfound knowledge. I can't stress enough how important it is for each and every one of us here today to get out there and have these difficult conversations with your friends and family. I also ask those in the audience watching this, please share the webinar on your Facebook and Instagram so others can see this too. Social media is extremely powerful and I strongly recommend anyone to use their voice. It is a pay it forward system where the three people you influence may turn into thousands of people down the line. The butterfly effect is real and together we truly can make a difference. Also, many people are scared to talk publicly about this topic, so we must support each other. So tag me at the Buzzy Kiwi and I'll reshare your post to encourage a supportive and safe community so others feel like they can use their voices too. The voters are 50-50 in the polls and I truly believe that once people learn the truth, it is a no-brainer to vote yes. And to give you the confidence you need, we have brought together an expert panel of incredibly intelligent people to help you in your informed decision. As I go through the panelists, please understand this is an extremely short list of their overall credentials, simply because we have a short amount of time and I want to dive straight into the reasons why we're here to answer the questions about cannabis. So I'll start with Chris Wilkins. He is the leader of the drug research team at the Shore and Fariki Research Center at Massey University, and he has researched drug use and illegal drug markets for the past 20 years. Marta Reichert is a senior researcher at Massey University with expertise in drug policy and public health and is also leading two research projects on cannabis law reform. Kylie Quince is an ex has expertise in criminal law and youth, particularly in Māori entanglement and justice systems. She's also the deputy chair of the New Zealand Drug Foundation and member of the Prime Minister's Chair Science Advisor Expert Panel. Ali Saifodin is, is a pharmacist and a pharmaceutical scientist specializing in drug delivery and dosage form design. He's also the course leader of the AUT Postgraduate Medicinal Cannabis Paper that I'm also currently studying. And then finally, we have Kathy Errington, who's the founding and executive director of the Helen Clark Foundation with expertise in public policy and is the author of the Case for Yes report released in 2019. So thank you to the panelists being here. Absolutely honored to be a part of this and to help guide this discussion. One last point before we get into these questions is just some housekeeping points to cover for the Zoom webinar. So, Anyone in the audience, the 150 people right now, we can't see or hear you. To interact with the panelists, you have to write questions in the Q&A function below. And then remember that those questions can be voted on by you. And I will go through and choose questions to ask the panel. So that is at the bottom here. The chat function is so people in the audience can talk with each other. Us, the panelists aren't going to be viewing this. So that's simply for you to communicate. And in regards to time, we only have an hour 15, an hour 10 now. So I'm sorry in advance to any panelists, I have to cut off sooner than you'd like. I'm gonna give a 60 second warning if that's the case. So we're gonna start with a some few set questions for each panelist to get the ball rolling and also give the audience time to write their questions in the Q&A function. So Kylie Quince, I'll start with you. Those against legalization claim it will increase cannabis use, and particularly among young people who are most at risk of cannabis-related harm. What, what does the evidence actually say will happen? 
Oh, kia ora tātou, uh, ngā mihi māhana kia koutou. Um, first thing I would say is that we need to look at current patterns of use, which, is, which tells us that cannabis use by young people, and we define young people as those aged under 25, that those have been dropping for the last 20 years. So since 2001, and this matches patterns of consumption of alcohol and also use of tobacco amongst young people, so cannabis use is, is dropping. So what the evidence does say is that um, prohibition or the illegality of cannabis is not a particularly um, important factor in young people's decisions to use uh, and consume cannabis. So what the evidence does tell us is that undoubtedly there will be some normalization of cannabis use following legalization and there will be um, Given, given the data that we have so far from some of the jurisdictions that have legalized in the past five to 10 years, there'll be an initial spike amongst young people in usage, uh, but nothing that will be um, uh, permanent in terms of uh, use by young people. Um, so there'll be an initial spike and then there will be a significant drop off. And, and the evidence from both Canada and most of the United States uh, states that have legalized actually shows that use by young people has declined post legalization. But I'm not sure that legalization is the magic factor there. The magic factor is that is a sociological one, which is that for two decades, young people actually aren't using as much cannabis as they as they had in the past. Amazing, but also I think a good point to talk about is what is the current impacts on Māori in New Zealand with prohibition? So in relation to Māori, Māori have been at the, the difficult end of, um, of drug of harm and harm in relation to health, justice and education that comes from prohibition. So in health, we're talking about Māori being twice as likely as non-Māori to suffer uh, cannabis use disorder and cannabis use disorder by that we mean you know people that use high potency uh, cannabis regularly so that smoke a lot and smoke cannabis that is quite strong. Māori are also more likely to live in areas of high deprivation which means you're, you're less likely to have good access to services if, um, if you do require uh, health-based interventions. In relation to justice, Māori more likely than non-Māori uh, to be convicted of use and possession. And that's notwithstanding the fact that the New Zealand police have effectively operated a decriminalisation regime since the mid 1990s. So police for most people have turned a blind eye to low level cannabis use and possession. Uh, but that the benefit of that discretion and that policy has not been passed through to Māori. So far less likely to be granted pre-charge warnings, much more likely to be convicted and still uh, likely to be sentenced to imprisonment. So there are still people in New Zealand who are imprisoned for solely for possession and use uh, of cannabis. It, it's sure it's it's a lot fewer than it was in the past, but they but they're still there. So health impacts, justice impacts. So uh, the law itself is um, is a harm. So the stigma that comes with conviction, of course, is, has huge impacts for people's, their own mental health well-being, but also impacts upon their whānau and community. The ability to, to keep a job, to seek employment once you have to have to disclose a cannabis-related conviction, opportunities for travel, which are significant considering the very significant number of Māori whānau who have moved to Australia, for example, to undertake uh, economic uh, opportunities there. Strains on relationships, um, strains in relation to seeking, either seeking or keeping housing. So, you know, the, the impact of prohibition per se are particularly significant for Māori populations compared with, with non-Māori. Wow, that's, that's quite incredible to hear that the prohibition, it, it affects everybody, but it specifically affects the Māori even worse. So that means that we would say a legal market is the way to go. And that's where I'm going to move on to Chris Wilkins and Marta Reicher to ask, what do you think is the best model for implementing a legal market for cannabis? Um, maybe I'll start. Um, the best model for, for, for legal cannabis, in my view, is the one that captures the benefits of some law reform, but avoids the danger of a fully commercial market with low prices, high availability, and the dangers that come uh, with that. So, so in between that prohibition and, and, and unrestricted fully commercial market model, there is a range of options there. Um, one option, for example, is government government monopoly, which is potentially good. Another option is what, what um, 
government proposes a tightly controlled and regulated market with strict regulations on potency prices and place of sale and advertising. The one options that, that we are fond of is um, something like a community trust model for retail sale of cannabis, where communities actually would have would manage sale of cannabis um, in their in their localities. They would manage the retail store stores they would also own the profits of retail store from retail stores and decide where these profits are spent on um, so that's the model i am personally fond of because that avoids that commercial imperative of expanding sales and give that agency um, to the communities and now the final the final point about when we think about these middle ground models like the legalization model proposed in the referendum is we can have the best model in the world but um, really even the best one can have bad outcomes if it's not implemented well so we, when we think about it let's think about good model and good implementation and why don't i share a link with the audience about the model that i've talked about the community trust i'll put it on the on the chat perfect that'd be fantastic and in regards to those models of selling cannabis, where should cannabis be sold and consumed? Is there a specific recommendation for the, the, that structure? Um, well, I can come in here and um, I guess just to reinforce what Marta was talking about, I think it's really important to that we don't forget the lessons from alcohol and tobacco, which are another addictive industry. So the really important levers there are price, uh, retail availability, number of outlets, and also having really strict regulation about um, advertising and promotion. So there's a real, um, it's really important for us to, to remind ourselves about those lessons, um, given that cannabis does, is an addictive substance, just like um, alcohol and tobacco. So it's, it's about, and also understanding that whenever you've got a uh, commercial uh, for-profit operator involved in selling those kinds of products that they tend to focus on uh, daily users. So they make all their money from um, encouraging daily use. About 80% of the profits from alcohol are from daily alcohol drinkers. So um, it's really important to keep that in mind. And they also tend to focus on vulnerable groups that are more likely to become addicted. So, and as Marta was talking about, you know, the way to avoid that kind of market, that commercial market, is to have not-for-profit and non-commercial approaches. And so that involves home growing, but it can also involve things like cannabis social clubs, which would be like an RSA for cannabis users, and also the community trusts, where the community trusts not-for-profit, and they're also required to give some of the money from selling cannabis back to the community for sports, arts, and other community activities. And there are provisions for that within the government's proposal, but we think it's really important that um, the government um, realises the benefits of that approach and, and actually um, follows through with their commitment to having a not-for-profit and a non-commercial market. It sounds like such a fantastic idea. That's where you can make the legal market have more positive effects than just the, the limiting on prohibition negatives. You can actually have it funding arts, funding schools, funding healthcare. So to kick on that topic of benefits of cannabis, I wanna go over to Ali and ask, how will recreational legalization affect the medicinal cannabis users? Thanks, Stephen. Care everybody. Um, for me, I think there are, there are three main points with regards to this uh, referendum that affects the medicinal cannabis scheme and also patients. Um, I'll talk about the benefits and, 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 and the risks as well. So the benefits are that patients will have better access. That's in terms of accessing cheaper cannabis products. Uh, they will, they'll be able to grow their own medicine if that's uh, what they want to do. So it's cheaper and better access to medicine. Um, another benefit is that there will be access to a wide range of products. So, so we know that cannabis... Um, in pharmaceutical terms, is only limited to preparations that have isolated cannabinoids, namely THC and CBD. 
but cannabis as a plant has many different chemovars, and each of those chemovars are good for certain conditions. So patients under the recreational scheme will have access to those uh, chemovars as well. Another benefit that I see, um, and this is unlike other countries like Canada, where they had a medicinal scheme and then a recreational scheme, what happened was most of the companies kind of double tap into both markets, both the adult market and the medicinal market. And, and when they started generating revenue from the adult market, um, there wasn't a lot of money and resources put into clinical trials and research. What we've done with this bill in New Zealand, I think is that the, um, the market is very much controlled in the recreational space. And that's going to, to mean more, more research, more clinical trials, and hopefully more com comprehensive evidence um, for, use of, for medicinal use of cannabis. The risk to this is uh, self-medication. Of course, you know, we, have, uh, we can regard cannabis like any other um, OTC over-the-counter over medicine that patients can buy from supermarkets and pharmacies. But that's a risk, but again, you know, uh, if, if we move into a legal world, patients can discuss this comfortably with their doctors. And so they can get input um, into whether or not cannabis um, is a good choice for their condition or with the combination of other medicines that they use. Thank you for that, Ali. I also wanted to just ask you one last question before we jump over to Kathy. Uh, those against legalization focus a lot on the harms of cannabis. But can you tell the people out there, from your knowledge, the large variety of medicinal benefits that can come from cannabis? Thanks, Stephen. I guess, you know, I could talk about the, the medicinal benefit of cannabis for hours. But um, just to summarize, you know, we have some clinical conditions that we have a lot of evidence, concrete evidence that support the use of cannabis. And then there are category of conditions that we still need more research and development to say for sure whether or not cannabis is useful in those areas. For, so, so for those we have evidence, the most commonly application of medicinal cannabis is for chronic pain. Um, not, not so good for acute pain, but for chronic pain, cannabis uh, is of course uh, effective. We also know that cannabis works um, synergistically with opioid drugs. And we know that we have this opioid ep uh, epidemic that is a problem um, that we face in the clinics nowadays. Cannabis can reduce the sense of reward um, when you take opioids like morphine. So, they, so it can be used also to help, not only to, to enhance the effect of opioids, but also to help reducing um, the physical dependence and tolerance that builds up to opioids. Um, cannabis is also used for management of multiple sclerosis symptoms. There are FDA approved preparations for that purpose, in particular for the control of spasticity, which is associated with uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, cannabis has been tried for treatment of um, um, specific types of epilepsy, those which are um, not responding to other, other treatments. We still need a little bit more research on that. Um, cannabis can be used to control nausea and vomiting due to chemotherapy um, and also um, um, uh, to treat the wasting condition that is um, you know, experienced uh, with, with patients having AIDS or HIV. There are a number of other health benefits and uh, clinical conditions that cannabis can be used. For example, mood and sleep problems. We need, we need more clinical data for these uh, conditions, for muscle spasm in general, for glaucoma, for um, uh, treating um, many different inflammatory uh, conditions, especially locally, for mental health conditions such as schizophrenia and uh, post-traumatic um, um, stress disorder. Um, uh, there are some studies on cancer um, uh, for metabolic disorders like diabetes. We know that there is now um, a cannabinoid called THCV, which can reduce the appetite. Also for irritable bowel syndrome, it reduces inflammation and symptoms. And more, more, most importantly, for neurodegenerative disorders that are, that are a huge problem these days for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Of course, we need 
a lot more research um, in this space. Wow, what a list. That's quite, quite impressive. And I like to bring up that point you keep making is that the evidence is showing these medicinal benefits, but we are struggling to actually be able to research it because of the, the problems with the law. And this is all around the world. So once we are able to actually legalize, that's going to become a lot easier to actually get more and more evidence on these medicinal benefits. That moves me over to Kathy for our last planned question, and then I'm going to move over to the Q&A section. So Kathy, you have said that good drug policy is not what you would expect. What do you mean by this? Well, hi everyone, and um, thank you so much to AUT for uh, supporting the event today, and thank you, Stephen, for, for cheering. Um, what I'm getting at there when I say that good drug policy isn't what you expect and that it can be a bit counterintuitive, what I mean is that just because if you're someone that really opposes cannabis and you want to see less used in society and less availability of cannabis in New Zealand, uh, that does not mean uh, that you should necessarily support uh, the ongoing criminalization of cannabis. Um, so there's been so much, um, I would say, honestly, propaganda about the, the evils of drugs uh, that sometimes I think we have disconnected our, our, the way we think about drug policy from, from the reality. Uh, and so drug policy in general, when you look at what drugs have ended up legal versus which ones are illegal, uh, if you really think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the much more harmful drugs like tobacco and alcohol uh, remain legal and widely available. But uh, drugs like cannabis have ended up illegal, uh, despite the fact that they remain widely used. And indeed, right since cannabis was criminalised in New Zealand, ever since, um, the use has remained very high. Uh, so New Zealanders have never accepted the criminalisation of cannabis. Um, we have never uh, accepted that law. And I sometimes say, can you imagine what would have happened in New Zealand if we had outlawed alcohol? Uh, because we came very, very close to doing it. Uh, after World War I, uh, it was put to referendum and the vote was so close that at the beginning, uh, the people that were voting to outlaw alcohol, it looked like on the night, it looked like they'd won. Uh, but then the votes from all the troops, all the Anzacs coming back on the boats from the war, um, when their votes were counted, they were so strong. I think there were 40,000 votes left to count and 32,000 of them, um, these were the troops' votes, 32,000 of them went for keeping alcohol available. And I just think, thank goodness that happened. <laughs> um, because can you imagine, and, and you look at what happened in the United States where things went the other way and they did outlaw alcohol. Uh, and you saw the rise of Al Capone and the rise of organized crime as we understand it. So, so yeah, what I'm getting at when I say good drug policy is unexpected, is that even if you don't like cannabis and you don't want to see it used in society, uh, you should support legalization. Um, and I guess the final point I'd just like to make before we go into the, the audience Q&A is that at a more personal level, um, I used to work uh, at the New Zealand Embassy, um, in a, at an embassy in Asia, uh, and I saw one of my jobs as a junior diplomat was to help support New Zealanders who got arrested. Um, and there are, if you exclude Australia, uh, New Zealanders in prison overseas are almost all there for drugs charges. Uh, and I, I came to really just think, what are we doing? <laughs> like, what are we doing to people? Um, you saw people, I, I saw and met people who, who got very long sentences uh, for nonviolent drugs offences. And I, I really just think that the justice system is not the right way uh, to deal with it. So, so yeah, that's where I'm coming from. Awesome, thank you for clarifying that. So I'm now moving into the Q and A and I'm going to be swapping back and forth, trying to keep an eye on what you guys are saying. They're quite long-winded questions, so just anyone watching, if you do have a question, try and make it more concise. But one point I want to bring up straight off the bat is someone's uh, kind of made an accusation that the whole panel is pro-legalization of cannabis because they're users themselves, which I don't think is the case. I know for a, for, a, for a fact that Chris Wilkins, you consider yourself very neutral, very in the middle ground. So if you could actually talk on that. Uh, and address these fears of people that we're all just cannabis users. Uh, well, I, I can't. I can't talk for everyone, but um, uh, certainly our position has been impartial, and we've tried to present the evidence, and and mainly because we recognise that even though if you get the, the evidence is impartial and it's inconclusive in a number of areas, particularly in terms of health and social impacts. But also inevitably people will overlay their own value system and moral judgments about drug use and cannabis use. 
So, but, but I, speaking for us, myself and, and my colleague, Marta Reichert, we've tried to remain impartial. And to be honest, I don't really necessarily think that that personal drug use is something that should be, should be you know, discussed within the, the debate. Fair enough. Cool, thank you for just clearing that up. I just wanted to get that out there from where it goes so that there's no negative uh, connotations towards everything else we say. Uh, something that I think is also really important to bring up in regards to what I just said is what are the panel's thoughts on the risks with legalization of cannabis? Uh, is there any risks and do the benefits outweigh those risks? Anyone would like to take that answer? Um, I, I guess I could just start off by just saying that there is, there is risks. So the first risk to me is commercialization. Um, increasing use, uh, particularly uh, dependent use, um, and also there's a risk among, among youth um, that, um, that there'll be more availability and more use. Um, I'll, I'll add to that that, of course, you know, every substance that you use uh, is going to have risk. Um, now, there's two ways to look at it. To compare it to, to other drugs like alcohol and tobacco, uh, cannabis is much safer. And then, and then if, if you're looking at a medicinal use, you know, the dosages are you know, a lot different. You know, the, the medicinal use, we're talking about a thousand fold um, a lesser dose than, than what a recreational person uses. So it really depends from, from person to person, but, but yes, everything has a risk, but I think cannabis has, has a very accepted safety profile um, in, in a lot of areas um, you know, that, that, that can help people to decide. I would just add to that, um, that obviously no model of legalization is going to be perfect. Um, and certainly, uh, even though uh, I do support legalization, I don't claim it's going to solve everything. In fact, the main reason that I support legalization is that I don't believe in a perfect world. Uh, I've gone to a lot of no campaign uh, events, uh, both online and um, back when we were allowed to do in person events. Uh, and uh, often the alternative that's presented is a drug free world, that that should be the goal. Uh, and I think that's an illusion and it's a really harmful illusion. Um, there is no world without drugs. Uh, and so what I, the reason I support legalization is that it meets people where they are now and it makes their lives better now. Uh, and, that, and that's ultimately why I, I do support a yes vote, even though I by no means advocate the, the use of cannabis and I do not use personally myself. Uh, but I, despite that, uh, I, I very much think it would be a better situation if we legalized. All right, thank you, team. Oh, it's Kylie. Kylie? Yeah, um, and, and I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm a criminal lawyer. I'm not a user. I'm not going to be a user. Legalisation is not a barrier to me like it isn't for most Māori. It's not for most New Zealanders. Prohibition is not the reason that we don't, that we don't use. We don't use for other reasons. Uh, but, I, but I do want to make the point that for, for most populations, the prohibition is not, you know, criminal law is not a great... Um, uh, driver of people's behaviour, one way, one way or another. There may be some temporary, you know, spike in use as a result of legalisation, but I think the the risks really are the ones that that Chris that Chris mentioned, which is potential risk about you know widening ourselves, you know, opening up to a, a fully you know big cannabis, big canner market, which this piece of legislation does not do. But of course, that doesn't bind future uh, future parliaments and future future governments, but you know, the, the risks that are there and the harms that we're talking about, we need, we need to remember that those harms are, are currently here in a prohibition market. So that, you know, that backs up Kathy's point that, um, you know, we, you're not talking about a binary between safe drug-free world under prohibition and controlled uh, world under a regulated, legalised market. This is about, as you say, balancing the, the risks and benefits. And I think that on, on the evidence, uh, the risks here are, are outweighed by the benefits. Awesome. Thank you for everyone adding your two cents to that question. That was such a good answer. I'm going to talk in relation to cannabis being compared to tobacco and alcohol very often. So someone has asked, is cannabis more addictive and harmful than tobacco or alcohol? Does anyone want to chime in and answer that from a I'll, I'll take that, Stephen. Um, 
uh, well, the, the simple answer is, is no. Um, cannabis does not cause physical dependence. So if you look at the, the pharmacology of addiction, uh, drugs like alcohol, alcohol is a bit dose dependent. So in lower doses, it doesn't cause physical dependence, but in higher doses, it causes physical dependence. Opoids cause physical dependence and so does tobacco. Cannabis doesn't cause uh, physical dependence. Um, uh, but of course, you know, you can look at the addiction as a psychological problem. And again, you know, you could develop uh, um, addiction to anything in this world. Um, and one last thing I want to, to mention, the recreational or the adult use of cannabis. Um, uh, this is really related to the previous question. But this is, this is just evolved during the time of prohibition. If you look at, if you look at prior to 1930s, Cannabis was present um, in almost all uh, pharmaceutical preparation, medicinal preparations. And, uh, and then as a result of prohibition, it became a drug and, um, and so it lost its, um, its uh, medicinal value. Um, I think I'll stop there. Cool. Thank you for answering that one, Ali. Uh, we have a question in regards to why medicinal cannabis and recreational cannabis keep getting talked about in the same light. And so I think we should address this to ask, what is the difference and why is recreational legalization the right answer rather than just improving the medicinal cannabis legislation? Marta? Um, uh, yeah, I can speak to the to the medicinal. There's been a couple of questions about that. So yeah, it is true that the medicinal cannabis scheme is already in place in New Zealand. So on the 1st of April, it became operational and um, people can get prescriptions for cannabis-based products from their doctors. The problem is that uh, there's a number of problems. First of all, um, we are still waiting for domestic companies to develop and get the products approved under this scheme. So really, there's at this stage, not much choice. The products are still expensive and at, at the moment they still need to be um, imported from overseas. So that's the situation at the moment. Um, it is hoped that with time there will be more domestically produced products. Now, under the medicinal cannabis scheme, the products that are envisioned are quite different than under the recreational scheme. So, so under the medicinal scheme, the priority is given to, to what will be allowed are the pharmaceutical dose uh, products, so the ones that you can, you, you buy from pharmacy and you can use them like pharmaceuticals, so oils, tinctures, patches, lozenges, these types of stuff. Um, cannabis for smoking, smokable products, is not allowed under the medicinal scheme. So, you know, this is to, to address that, that, uh, that risk that comes with smoking cannabis and that's, deter um, that's the impact on your lung function. So, we know that's the risk coming with smoking. So, you know, there, there is a difference between medicinal medicinal and recreational um, scheme. Um, the problem here in New Zealand is that we, we, we've waited a long time to enable access to medicinal scheme and many patients are still um, struggling to get products prescribed. And that's why there is this kind of um, push from the medicinal cannabis community to, to get broader access to perhaps be able to grow your own. Our medicinal scheme doesn't allow that. Uh, some schemes overseas allow that, so there's greater access for medicinal users, and th that's where it comes from. As I said, the products are quite different at this stage because under recreational law reform bill, what is initially envisioned is that only smoking products will be allowed. Um, at the initial stage. With time, um, oils, tinctures, um, other types of products will be allowed. So just to um, explain what's the difference, what's, 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 why, why is medicinal cannabis community um, supporting this bill? Because they, they still perceive that the access is limited. Can I jump in, Stephen? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I completely agree with everything that, that Marta said there and just want to add um, the equity point here, which is I mean, Marta talked about the issue in relation to the expense of medicinal cannabis, but I actually think it's bigger than that. And I think that the, the languaging around medicinal versus recreational is, I, I find, a bit problematic. And, and if I'm going to be perfectly blunt, I think that those are terms that are really a sap to 
the chattering Pākehā middle classes, as, as if one kind of consumption uh, should be legalised and condoned and supported and, and the other should not. So I, I think that that's, uh, that's uh, you know, a little bit problematic. But the equity, and so the equity issue is, is twofold. One, one, there's not only the particular expense of access to uh, access to the medicinal cannabis scheme, but also e equity access in terms of having access to a doctor who will prescribe. Now, if you live in remote communities where you don't, in, in Auckland and Wellington, we, we'll be fine because you not you'll be able to find a, a doctor that will assist you in accessing um, the medicinal cannabis scheme. If you live in a remote community with one GP, GPs are not required to support um, pr the prescribing of, of cannabis. And we know that there has been, you know, quite significant conservatism amongst, uh, amongst the um, uh, medical community. And the third thing is, is to go back to the point that Ali made earlier, which is about the distinction between the organic pr pr product and pharmaceutical ones. And that medicinal cannabis only allows, allows users access to pharmaceutical uh, preparations that are not allowing people access to all of the other aspects, um, the pharmacological aspects of, of organic cannabis. And, and if people want to prefer that, um, then they should have access to that rather than access to incredibly expensive Sativex or Tilray. Yeah, that's uh, such a good point. I would just add one, Kathy? I, I just said one quick, I thought um, that was brilliant from Kylie, so I don't have I have much to add other than if you look at uh, the report, which my colleague Paul has linked in the chat that we wrote called The Case for Yes, um, we use the term personal use of cannabis rather than recreational, because recreational makes it sound like you're using it to have fun, which is of course one reason that people use cannabis, but it's often a lot more complicated than that, right? Like if it, there isn't always a bright line between um, what is, you know, our, our, our scheme attempts to draw a bright line between what's medicinal use and what isn't, but there are a lot of people who, who say, and I believe them, that they need cannabis to get through whatever they're going through. Uh, and some of them may be able to get a script uh, from a doctor for what they're doing, but many of them are not. Uh, it, in some reason, it might be the GP is not willing to give them one. Uh, it might be they can't afford, you know, $1,000 a month to pay for their prescription. But uh, there isn't necessarily a, a really sharp distinction between those two things. Uh, and, and yeah, that, um, ha have a look at our report if, uh, if you're interested. Oh, I'll just add you, to this, oh, sorry, to add some research in here. I totally agree with Kylie and Cathy and um, definitely that the, the, there is uh, a lot of research exploring this, what, what researchers call the blurred line between medicinal and recreational use. There's a number of, of papers on this. Some people use it for well-being and so on. Um, and just to follow up on, on, the, on the access, agree, um, there's, there, there's quite um, quite an issue there. Last year, we've conducted a survey of medicinal cannabis users, and over 3,000 respondents, people who used cannabis for medicinal reasons last year. Most of the people, unsurprisingly, um, sourced it from black market, but there, there, there was a proportion who sourced it, who asked their doctor for a prescription, namely 15% of, of, of the survey participant asked for a prescription and um, uh, quite uh, disappointingly, 5% actually received a prescription. So, so just to add some number there, uh, Roughly one in three patient requests is, is, uh, was positive. That's, from, that's data from last year. Stephen, can I just add uh, very quickly, because I think this is a very important question and people are often confused um, with regards to recreational and medicinal use. In my personal opinion, I think if we had a more flexible medicinal scheme, we wouldn't really necessarily need a recreational scheme as well. And, and one thing that we have to understand, especially our, our medical community, is that cannabis as a plan, as a, as, a, as a natural medicine, it doesn't fit into the modern system of medicine. There's, there's so many subtypes of the plant. So it, there are over 100 different cannabinoids. There are a number of different terpenes, and combination of these have very different effects. So in my opinion, if you just have the medicinal scheme, we are not going to be able to harness the full potential of cannabis as a medicine, whereas uh, the recreation or, or the legalization in general will allow us to be able to use those, those strains, those, those chemovars, 
and, and be able to harness the full potential of the plant. Yeah, very, very good points by everybody there. Yeah, that's it's very important to make the distinction that recreational cannabis has a lot of different products. It's not just smoking cannabis. You've got ointments, you've got balms, you've got tinctures, you've got oils. And a lot of those, especially the full spectrum plant, is not going to be in the medicinal scheme because like Ali said, it doesn't fit into the current mold. And then others might say, oh, well, we just need to change the medicinal scheme or we need to just have decriminalization. Let's put that, make it clear, this is not the choice. We don't have that choice. We have a choice between recreational legalization or not. So it's either stick to the status quo or go with the recreational and control it. Just want to make that point clear. We want to move on to the next question, which is what are the main lessons we have learned from overseas experiences that might translate to New Zealand situation? Anyone want to I, could, um, I could answer some of that. I think um, the first one is that um, commercialization of cannabis. So um, in uh, places like Colorado and Washington that were the first to legalize cannabis, um, they've seen a lot of industry influence within the regulatory framework. So these kind of um, partnerships with the industry in terms of developing regulatory frameworks, I think have been shown to be you know, a real failure. Um, the other thing is um, making sure that taxation is linked not to uh, the value of the product, but linked to weight and THC potency, because what's been found overseas, particularly in the United States, is the price of legal cannabis has declined by about 50% or more. And that means not only is the, the price lower, but also the tax take has been lower. And I guess the final thing that I would mention is retail outlet regulation. So getting local communities to have a say in terms of what the re retail um, environment should be for cannabis. So even in Colorado, a lot of counties have actually voted to um, not have any retail outlets within their counties. So, and to me, that actually seems like quite a positive thing in terms of getting communities involved in how they want to see cannabis sold. Fantastic. Uh, if no one else wants to jump in there, I, oh, Kylie, I'm jump in. in. Um, two, two things I want to say about lessons we've learned from the North American experience. One is the involvement or a cons consultation involvement and partnership with indigenous peoples. No other jurisdiction has done that. Canada was a disaster. So it, the, the legalization of cannabis has had no positive benefits or effects for indigenous and native peoples of, of Turtle Island. So both in relation to Canada and, uh, and mainstream United States. Um, so our, our scheme has done that from the outset. And there are two parts to that. One is the involvement of indigenous peoples per se, both prospectively and retrospectively. So retrospectively in terms of addressing and acknowledging the ha disproportionate harm done to particular communities. So the, the long title of our, the bill that we're voting on in the, this referendum does that. It acknowledges the harm done to Māori and other groups who have suffered disproportionate harms by, uh, by the prohibition of cannabis. But prospectively, it allows for both consultation and representation of Māori on the Cannabis Advisory Group. So participation in the formation of new drug law policy which includes you know, the amount, the type, the preparations. So that's really significant. And that's living up to our, our tiriti of Waitangi or Waitangi uh, obligations. The other thing I would say is uh, in relation to policing. So although I've said that, I, that I, in my view, I do think that there are um, significant benefits to be had in terms of the justice outcomes of, of legalization, um, one risk is what that we've learned from the other jurisdictions is that the policing, all it does is it shifts the boundary. So it, it will allow you to possess and use, but it will not allow possession and use by under 20 year olds. It will not allow uh, usage in public spaces. So the, the new regulation has still been policed in ways that are disproportionately harming young people, young men and indigenous and minority People. So every single jurisdiction that is legalized still has disproportionate and racist policing and discrimination for young people, for indigenous peoples, and for African American people. So this is not a panacea in relation to justice. That's a lesson that we can learn from those other jurisdictions. So in other words, what can, we can do is we need to do more in terms of you know, addressing discriminatory law enforcement in Aotearoa. Kia ora.
And I'd just say one uh, quick thing from uh, the perspective of a kind of drug policy perspective. Um, the, in general, internationally, I think we're moving away from what was called the war on drugs uh, in the 1960s, uh, led by the United States. You had a very strong push to criminalize drugs, uh, particular drugs, not alcohol and not tobacco, but other drugs were criminalized and very strict penalties were introduced. And it isn't just New Zealand that is kind of giving up and walking away from that. It's all kinds of countries. Uh, Uruguay has legalized cannabis, uh, Canada, some states in the United States, uh, Mexico had a Supreme Court decision that has forced them to reconsider their cannabis laws. Uh, there's all, we're, not, we're not alone uh, in moving into this space. Um, the Netherlands for many years has had uh, a, a policy of uh, kind of de facto legalization of uh, consumption of cannabis. So we're, we're not the only ones doing this and we're not the only ones that have looked at our drug laws and thought this isn't based on anything that makes sense. Um, and I would just, uh, on our report that I know my colleague Paul has linked in the chat, I would really encourage you, one of my favorite graphics is on page 14 of that report, which looks at and analyzes the relative harms of different drugs. Uh, and you look at that graph and look at how harmful alcohol is, um, but we tolerate it being legal and available in society. A and look at how relatively unharmful cannabis is, uh, and yet that remains illegal. So it's just kind of saying, why don't we approach this from a more sensible perspective and then regulate those harms? Uh, and and wouldn't that be more effective? Fantastic. Well, amazing answers, everybody. We'll move on to the next question now because we are uh, blind, blind, blinding through the time here. Let's talk about, someone's asked, is there any data on how producing and exporting cannabis would impact New Zealand's economy, creating jobs, production of cannabis and related products? Could someone answer how this, uh, the economic benefits of legalization? Anyone gonna pipe up there? Because if no one does, I can definitely take this one. <laughs> yeah, um, I can say a little bit about that. Um, so basically, uh, we've we've done some modelling, and we think that um, uh, returns from cannabis taxation in New Zealand, based on what's happened in Colorado, which is a similar size um, population, is somewhere between maybe two hundred to three hundred fifty million dollars in tax per year. Um, and there will be some some industry, obviously, and some jobs created. Again, but I think the real risks are depending on how the market is actually set up. So there's certainly the way that the, the cannabis is as a product that it lends itself to large scale production uh, just because the cost per production is gonna go down. So there's a real danger that over time the cannabis economy will become globalized and there'll be some really big players. So there's gotta be a real effort to um, prevent that happening. And also with those big players, you tend to get lower lower prices. So there, there will be some, some economic benefits, but also the other provision there is to balance that against any additional social and health harm that is basically paid for by the taxpayer. Um, the, the bill, uh, I, I would just pop in and say, has, uh, I think Chris raises hugely valid points about the risks of commu commercialization. And the, it, there was a report released yesterday uh, from Bill about analyzing that question in some depth. And I think it's a really useful report to have a look at if you're interested in, uh, in, just in these issues further, because you can see how many recommendations from Bill that the government adopted and has um, taken into how they structured the, the market. Uh, and so some key things in there to help address that risk of commercialization is no, a, a, under the bill we're voting on, uh, no one player can control more than 20% of the market. And there's also a cap on the total amount of cannabis that can, uh, on the total market, uh, the total amount that can be produced. So uh, those, those risks of commercialization are very real. And I think the bill has done a really good job of addressing them uh, and limiting the, the power that any one company could have. But absolutely, it's something we need to keep a close eye on and constantly review and monitor how things are going um, because you, you, you don't our experience with tobacco showed the risks of having major commercial interests that have an incentive to undermine public health yeah great points there uh, Kylie I'll let you go next finally to, to jump in on um, what Chris has already said and I see that Kylie Mercier um, from the Drug Foundation has 
posted reference in, in a link in the Q&A, uh, is that today the Ministry of Justice released um, the report that they've commissioned a modelling done by Business Economic Research Limited in relation to econ potential economic impacts of uh, legalisation. And they have said that $675 million annual take, um, long-term improved health outcomes. So that's uh, in relation to the excise tax, licensing fees, um, an additional $181 million a year from GST, $40 million a year in income uh, and company tax. So we're talking about really not only significant take, but of course savings in relation to spending on law enforcement, spending on, on um, current health, um, health costs of prohibition. Yeah, I think that's such a good point to make is that currently for people's information, we are spending $305 million a year on enforcing the law of prohibition. And that is 87% of the drug enforcement budget, which is quite an outrageous number. And then also I wanna make the point very clear that the economic benefits are happening right now, but they're going to the gangs. And the New Zealand Drug Index report shows that 90% of gangs income comes from cannabis. So. It's either put that into a regulated commercial market where that money's being taxed and going back to the government or leave it in the hands of the black market. And I think anyone out there can understand why we want to take the money from the black market. All right, the next question I think is a really important question to answer because this is a fear that's thrown around a lot and it's about the gateway theory. Uh, what is people's, people have concerns that normalizing cannabis will lead to other people using harder drugs. Does anyone have a say on this? Um, Stephen, from, from um, you know, if, if you look at, there's, there's two angles to this. So, so one is the science and the pharmacology. If you look at the pharmacology, no, the answer is no. Uh, uh, if you smoke cannabis, you're not going to, uh, you know, uh, develop some sort of reaction in your body that you, you, you want to try, uh, you know, other drugs. Um, then there is that social aspects, which I leave um, the rest of um, the panel members to, to address. But I think from what, uh, what we've learned from other countries, this is, uh, this is not really the case. If you look at Canada, for example, uh, consumption of cannabis after legalization in, in young people has has reduced. If you look at Netherlands and Scandinavia, we see the same thing. And um, so um, uh, one thing that we need to remember that this bill, the recreational bill, the, the main aim is to reduce harm in our society. And, um, and that is through, through more education, you know, the tax revenue can be used for education the youth to provide more health services. And, um, you know, altogether, you know, that it aims to, to reduce harm. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, um, that whole gateway hypothesis really has been debunked by, by, by the scientists. And if anything, in that respect, I think that separating the users, separating the legal market from the black market, rather, in that respect, from social perspective, can have benefits of kind of, you know, people just go to the retail store with with cannabis and buy it legally, uh, rather than going to the black market where they are exposed to other drugs. To, to reinforce that point that Marta's just made, so to make it very clear that under the proposed, uh, under the bill that we're voting on, uh, the places, outlets that license premises were, that we're selling cannabis will not be able to sell alcohol, and clearly they're not going to be selling unlawful drugs. So if you're going to get your if you're going to get your drugs from the mongrel mob or the headhunters, you might be offered methamphetamine. You will not be offered methamphetamine. You will not be offered even a lime red when you go to buy legal cannabis. So. Um, there's, there is both social and legal persuasion, uh, dissuasion from a separation of the two markets, as Marta said. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make. And I, I'll speak on behalf of the younger generation here in New Zealand. Uh, the access to harder drugs comes from going to buy cannabis in the black market, hands down. It's, that is the gateway right there. So we want to take it away from those people that are peddling harder substances. Uh, uh, one of the main questions in the Q&A that has been liked and thumbs up, just to reinforce everyone listening,
go into the Q&A because we only have about 10 minutes left of questions. And like any question you really want answered because there's too many for us to get through in a short amount of time. But this one is in somewhat relation to what we've just been talking about. How does the bill plan to limit the public visibility of cannabis when it's going to be more popular than ever? Um, so the bill prohibits the public consumption of cannabis. Um, it can be consumed in licensed premises or in private homes. Um, so I, I think it, it, it takes significant steps to try and limit the public visibility of cannabis. I don't think it will be you know, in your face uh, the way some people fear. Um, but I would probably also question the, the statement that it's going to be more popular than ever uh, because I, I, I would look at something like what's happened, New Zealand's experience with regulating tobacco, where, you know, the, at the beginning of the 1980s, a third of New Zealanders smoked, uh, but uh, during the 1990s, uh, tobacco use declined faster here than anywhere else in the OECD, uh, and now only 13% of New Zealanders smoke. Um, we actually did a webinar about that history, if you're interested. Um, maybe, Paul, you can drop a link in the chat um, about the New Zealand's history trying to regulate the tobacco industry. But um, we basically... Um, the the bill I, I, my goal and the, i would say that what the bill is setting out to do is to try and make cannabis as boring as possible uh, and, and that it's there and it's available but uh, ultimately in time young people will associate its use with you know their grandparents and parents which is the best way to stop young people doing something and um, so uh, I, I genuinely do not think uh, i think if we do vote for this it will be the non-event of the year <laughs> Marta, jump in um, there So as well. I'll just add, yeah, one thing is what Cathy uh, talked about, the um, um, regulations on, on consumption and the ban on consumption in public spaces. I guess some other kind of measures that are in the bill is, uh, for example, how the retailers will be visible or it's intended they're not visible, right? There's only, they're, they're going to be very, according to the bill, very, um, very uh, not appealing and there won't be any neons and advertising on them. The products will not be displayed to the outside. So they're, they're, they're supposed to be very non-attractive uh, under the bill. Also, there is, a, there, is, there is a total ban on advertising in any means, whether it's new, no advertising in newspaper. Supposedly, this also covers the internet of course there is a question of how well um, advertising or or let's call it covert advertising or celebrity endorsement can be policed but that's something um that's something that we need to pay attention you know um and make sure that that what's what's proposed the total ban on advertising is what eventuates in practice and that um, that that happens yeah so there's a number of measures around advertising public visibility of retailers and the ban on consumption in public places yeah very good points to make just to reinforce to everybody you're not going to be able to see any signage there's not been any advertisement they can't sponsor events it's absolutely completely hidden uh, a couple last questions because we are running out of time one of the other most popular questions is what evidences from overseas about rates of driving under the influence before and after legalization and any harms to other road users? Does anyone have information about this? Oh, what I know is that the evidence is still mixed. We are still early in the in the debate. The, the, the longest we've had the legal shops is Colorado, Washington, around six years. The evidence is still mixed. Some studies show no increase in uh, driving under the influence of cannabis. Some studies uh, from some places showed uh, some increase. Uh, now, when, when we think about this, we always need to consider how, how the studies actually measure um, the, you know, the association between the, the driving and potentially the, the accidents, because the problem with cannabis is that it can stay in your blood system for a, for a long time, um, but that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you are still impaired. So, so that's been talked about a lot that we need a good system for measuring impairment under cannabis not just the fact that you have cannabis in your in your system and you used it last week for example so uh, but in summary the evidence is uh, is mixed there I, I think a good point to raise to people as well is to think about drink driving right uh, 10 years ago we went hard with the advertising advertisements of don't drink drive or else you're a 
you're not cool uh, and stop your mates from drink driving you're a legend and and growing up in that I, I actually grew up I was 18 years years old right when that was all happening and I watched people stop each other from drink driving because it really does work and that's what will happen with cannabis and driving we're going to be able to actually bring it out of the shadows and start educating the young people no this is not cool it's not okay and then as a societal thing we get together and we actually stop each other so that's only going to happen when we take it out of the shadows and actually talk about this topic uh, yeah that's just my two cent piece on that i think we are coming to uh, pretty much our last question uh, so i will try and pick wisely because there's a couple here I think this is a really important one. If cannabis is decriminalized, aka legalized, what do you envision happening to those already sentenced for cannabis related crimes? Kathy? Um, so the current bill that we're voting on, unfortunately, does not address uh, people who carry um, previous cannabis convictions, other than the fact that they will not be prohibited from uh, it so long as they have uh, low level convictions, so no compounding factors like violence. Um, uh, they won't be prohibited from taking part in the legal market. Um, and that's a really important acknowledgement that some communities in New Zealand, particularly Māori, have been uh, much, much more heavily policed for their cannabis use than than non Māori. But uh, unfortunately, we uh, our report called for people with low level convictions to have those convictions expunged uh, because we know how widespread use is and those convictions are kind of random and unfair. Um, but, but the bill does not do that. It's not going to expunge uh, people's convictions. And can I say something about that, which is that another lesson we can learn from some of those other legalised jurisdictions, which have, have looked at the question of expungement or dealing with at least having a scheme where people can uh, apply to have convictions uh, expunged, either by operation of law, which means that people don't have to do anything and they are automatically, by operation of law, um, vanish, um, or to have a scheme where people apply for them. Um, if of, um, of such a scheme, there is an ability, of course, with, this is a bill, so uh, after the referendum, if we support the bill, the bill needs to go through the usual lawmaking process, which will include the select committee process, which is where members of the public can make, um, make their, their views about uh, that kind of uh, aspect to, to the legalisation regime um, known or, or show support for it. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make to people is that once this bill does go through and it is a yes, we are going to be having public debate where we can actually influence the bill. So if you think there needs to be harsher restrictions or more controls, you can have that say and those, those things can be changed. So it's really important that you don't say no to this because you don't agree with one little part of the bill because that's all able to be addressed. All right, team, we are coming up to our last 10 minutes and the reason I'm going to move on to the final messaging just because this webinar will just cold turkey shut off and I don't want people just talking and it just to completely stop. So I'm going to ask each panelist this last final question. What's the final message you would like to say to the people of New Zealand leading up to this vote? I will start with you Kylie because you're on on the screen. Okay, here's my whiz bang finish. So the upcoming referendum gives us an opportunity to support uh, drug laws that are underpinned by evidence-based public health approaches. Voting yes means a clear statement of what is and what is not lawful. Voting yes is a vote for equality and equity and helping to eliminate racism and law enforcement. Voting yes means directing police resources and taxes to enforce regulation and to address harms caused by cannabis. Voting yes means placing controls around a currently unregulated market and will enable schools to bring in um, education and public health responses to dissuade young people uh, from using. Voting no means supporting the current position and all of the harms that come with it. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thanks, Kylie. We will move on to Marta next. Marta, if you could give us your final statement on what's the final message you'd like to say to New Zealand about the vote. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to have a look at the bill, have a look at what we're actually voting on, what are the measures in place, um, what is the alternative to prohibition, and you know, you really need to understand what, uh, um, what measures are put to protect public health, because um, uh, that's the key here. Um, and, and and once you know that, then, you know, think about your values, where do you place the values, um, you know, around criminal justice, around potential economic benefits, if that's important to you, about the personal right to use cannabis, that's also something that should be considered. And then about communities, public health, and all the risks we've mentioned around commercialization. And where, taking account in those values, think about whether this proposed law addresses your uh, values better or uh, you'd rather stick with um, what we have now and maybe um, maybe that's better according to um, how you weight your your um, preferences and values thank you Marta we will move next on to Chris if you could give us your final closing statement about your views on the votes coming up yeah, I would say that um, if you're looking overseas at the jurisdictions that have already legalised cannabis, um, and people often say, start to talk about the impacts, but the reality is we probably won't know the full consequences of the legalisation in those places for maybe five to ten years, just because it's taken a while for them to develop the industry, establish retail outlets, and there's still regulation going on. So um, the actual impacts are pretty, in terms of evidence, are pretty inconclusive. Um, what we could say about legalisation off the bat is that clearly we'll get some tax income and that could be fairly substantial in the 500 million range. Um, we we'll, uh, won't arrest people, but the, the longer term consequences in terms of um, health and social impacts are relatively unknown. And so the real um, the response to that is to make sure the market is as strict as possible and take a very conservative approach in terms of commercialisation. And that may well turn out to be harder than people think because the cannabis industry, which is now largely owned by the alcohol and tobacco industry, are masters at influence. So and you can already see within New Zealand, they're building up networks of influence to make sure that um, regulation is watered down and they get more opportunity to make profits. All right, thank you for that. And Ali, I'll go to you, cut to you next. Thanks, Stephen. My message uh, as a pharmacist and a health professional and academic is that there is an ocean of evidence supporting the health benefits, health benefits of cannabis as a medicine. And cannabis as a drug has a very acceptable safety profile. And uh, it's also important to, to note that this bill assures and aims for reducing harms to our society. Um, as a person, I really believe that cannabis is a gift from nature to us. And uh, my message is that whatever you do and whoever you are, please base your decisions on scientific evidence, not beliefs. A yes for a researcher like me is going to mean better access, easier access to cannabis, more data and more evidence with regards to both benefits and risks associated with the drug. Kiara. Thank you, Ali. And finally, we'll go over to Kathy for your closing statement on what's the final message you'd like to say to New Zealand about the up and coming vote. Uh, firstly, no matter what your views are, um, please enrol to vote. Uh, you can check right now um, if you're enrolled, you, uh, you know, cut me off, just um, Google uh, how to vote uh, and check that you're enrolled. Um, the second thing I would say is that in my view, uh, this referendum is a chance to make New Zealand a fairer and better place. Uh, it's not a referendum that will make New Zealand perfect, uh, but I, like I said, I don't believe in a perfect world, I believe in a better world, and uh, this is one step towards doing that. Um, for, and this referendum is also a real chance to rectify a long-standing injustice in New Zealand, which is that uh, I, I've, again, like I said, I've gone to no campaign events and they talk a lot about we need to send a message. We need to send a message that cannabis is wrong. But uh, we've used young Māori men to send that message. We've made them carry uh, convictions that have stunted their 
potential. Uh, and we've done that for nothing. Uh, the, all the evidence shows that people who are convicted of cannabis offences continue to use at the same rate. Uh, so I would just say that we have plenty of evidence about how our current approach works and it fails to prevent use, it fails to control the potency of cannabis, it fails to accept the reality of how New Zealanders actually live their lives uh, and New Zealanders have never accepted uh, the law. So I would say uh, all of the, all of what we do now is wasteful. It's wasteful of human lives, it's wasteful of court time, it's wasteful of police time uh, and we would be so much better off using all of those resources uh, towards better health treatment, better education. Um, and so ultimately, I think our current prohibition on cannabis is wrong in principle and unworkable in practice. Cheers team. Thank you to all the panelists for your expertise and your guidance. This is amazing information. I just want to really also thank the audience out there that is watching and reinforce to you, if you are still watching, please share this on this video on Facebook and Instagram. We really do need to spread this message to as many people as possible. If you spread it to three people and they spread it to three people, all of a sudden we can actually get this education out to New Zealand. It's a 50-50 right now in the polls and 1% of the vote is about 50,000 people. So let's get out there, let's actually use our voice. And if you need more information, go. I encourage you to go over and check out the Case for Yes report from the Helen Clark Foundation. It's got a lot of information in there. You've also got the Chief Science Advisors report. And also, the, these are all going to be put in the links in the Zoom chat. So you can go have a look at that right now. And you can also go over to my Facebook and Instagram at the Buzzy Kiwi and see the other interviews I've done and the educational content I've created. So we got there. we have all on time. We have really hit a lot of points on the head. Like I said, guys, you can go over to the chat box. There's links being put in there as we speak. I will give you the last couple of minutes before this webinar shuts off for you to go in and get those, those bits of information and reports. I'd just like to say thank you again to all the panelists. If any panelists would like to say thank you or goodbye or anything, you can chime in now. Otherwise, I appreciate you. I appreciate everybody who joined us today. And again, go out and vote. You must vote. Ed education is key but voting is the most important part. I'm not even telling you to go vote yes, I'm just telling you to vote, all right? Go out and vote. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, everyone.